What's up, guys? It's your girl, Taylor. Um, welcome back to this channel. So today I'm going to go over kind of just an overview of my AMCAS application. And just so you know, kind of where I stood in the medical school process, um, I got 11 interviews total. And so far, I have five acceptances. Um, all of the others are wait lists. So I actually haven't been rejected from anyone who's interviewed me so far, which is really exciting. Okay, so the first thing I want to point out, and this is honestly a very important thing, is the submission date. So you can start, or at least last year, you were able to start filling in information in May, but it couldn't be submitted until like the very beginning of June, I believe. Um, so as you can see, I submitted on June 4th, which was right within like the first week of being able to submit or the first two weeks. And it took almost a month for this to get processed. So when you send your application, the AAMC actually looks it over. They really specifically look at the grade section to make sure that that matches your transcript. And it's not until that happens that they'll send your application to other schools. So if you wait to submit it, just know that when you submit it, it's not going directly to the school. So there is kind of a buffer period. Um, so the earlier you send it, the better chance you have of it getting to schools faster. And a lot of schools do interviews on a rolling basis. So they will interview people throughout the season, but interview slots will start to fill up and eventually class seats will start to fill up. So if you don't submit your application until like November, there might be people who are already accepted into that medical school. So you're fighting for less seats. So it's ultimately really vital that you get in your application as soon as possible. With that being said, of course, you want to make sure your application is solid. So don't submit it until you're ready to. Like I said, this is kind of the overview of my application. I plan on going over all of the parts in more detail in separate videos. So stay tuned for that. Um, but just starting with the very beginning, of course, the first thing you're going to have is all of your demographic information. So I've blurred most of it out just for privacy reasons, um, but you'll have like your address, your name, your citizenship, um, your gender, race, things of that nature. And then you'll also have a lot of information regarding your parents and any siblings that you have. Um, so they'll ask for like your parents' degree, um, their jobs, family income, stuff like that. Um, you can also put any languages that you speak. So if you're bilingual, you can put all of the languages that you're able to speak and to what degree you're able to speak them. Okay, And then these sections right here kind of auto populate based on what you put above. Um, so I believe this is fully based on like your parents information. And then I am first generation. Um, neither of my parents graduated college. So there is that. And I don't have any siblings, so this is blank. This is where you'll put um, any like legal trouble. So if you had institutional actions while you were in school or any um, involvement with the law, that will go there. And then the next section is the grade section. So for these first two classes, I actually took a couple of college classes while I was in high school. So that's what these first two are. Um, and then from there, it starts with my degree at Cornell. Um, so as you can see, I got kind of lots, lots of A's and B's. Um, I had quite a few B's in the very beginning of my career, just trying to figure out how to do college and moving away, you know, 800 miles from home was definitely an adjustment. Um, I also got AP credit for the calculus class I took in um, high school, so that is shown there. Yeah, some classes I took pass-fail, most classes had a grade. Yeah, and I should also say, I guess, um, let me go back up really fast. So I majored in biological sciences with a concentration in neuroscience. And actually in the very beginning of college, I was going to be a psych major. Um, so you still have all of my kind of like pre-med um, requirements like bio, chem, stuff like that. Um, but I did take quite a few um, psych classes as well. Like social psychology, behavioral neuroscience. I took statistics in the bio um, or in the psych department. And then 
during my sophomore year, I switched to becoming a bio major. Okay, so those are all my grades. Um, as you can see, did not get a degree from the college I went to for the few um, high school classes that I took, but obviously I have my degree from Cornell. And then as far as my kind of stats go, so my overall cumulative GPA, uh, my overall GPA was a 3.62, my science GPA was a 3.55, and then my all other was a 3.75. So as you can see, I didn't have the strongest GPA. I was definitely not a 4.0 student. Definitely struggled in the very beginning of my undergraduate career as far as grades go. Um, but I think a really important thing to consider is the upward trend that comes kind of as you get used to college, hopefully. So as you see, the very beginning, I had a 3.01. I was not happy with that. I was in tears thinking, oh my God, I'm never going to get to med school. What am I going to do? But by my senior year, I was able to pull a 3.8. So it's like the beginning of my career definitely tanked my overall GPA, um, but you can definitely show growth to an admissions committee if you can do better in your later years. So I think that's really important. And then I know some people will probably say like, okay, you didn't have the best GPA, but you went to an Ivy League. So I don't know how much weight, I cannot say how much weight the name of Cornell had in my application. All I can say is these are my statistics and it's possible to get into med school even without a 4.0, so. And then for my MCAT, I got a 507. Um, if you wanna watch my MCAT reaction video, I will link it up here. But yeah, I also wasn't super happy with that score. Um, and I debated for a long time if I wanted to retake it. But ultimately I really didn't wanna go through the stress and time commitment of having to study for it again. So I decided I'm just going to shoot my shot with my 507. If I don't get in, I will retake it and, you know, try to get a better score. Um, but yeah, overall, 68% um, for my rank tile. As you can see, I got a 124 in cars. Everyone, I feel like there's so many myths online that if you get below a 125 in any section, you have to retake it. And you don't. It worked for me, so... <laughs> Okay, so the next section you get into is your extracurriculars. Um, so for my extracurriculars, um, they sort by your most recent, like your current extracurriculars, all the way to the furthest away. I hope that made sense. Um, so at the time of my application, I was doing psychiatric clinical research. And so I actually was able to start a personal project. So that's what this first one is. And then I have my actual kind of like research assistant position. Um, and this is really the bulk of my clinical experience. And I think this is really what allowed me to shine in my application. I absolutely love talking about this experience with everyone. Um, and I'm my application is very psychiatry driven and that's ultimately what I want to do. Um, and I think this just really showed that I have that really deep interest in psychiatry and I really wanna be a psychiatrist um, and I really wanna to go to med school. Oh so yeah, um, you can pause all these descriptions if you want to read them. Um, I'll kind of give an overview. I really just tried to tell patient stories and a little bit of you know the impact I had. So trying to use numbers, like I conducted over 80 structured interviews, often spending a minimum of three hours interviewing each, each patient which shows I spent a lot of time with patients in these interviews. Um, and then I also tried to tell a story of, you know, patients that inspired me, what I got out of a patient interaction, you know, like talking with this woman who had been in and out of rehab and seeing how her mental illness kind of accumulated because of her life circumstances. You know, she had a trauma that led to depression that led to an opiate addiction. It just kind of you know, inspired me that she's continuing to fight and, you know, medicine for some people, the healing journey is not a linear path. It's can go up and down and all around. So stuff like that. I was also a teaching assistant for um, a genetics lab course in undergrad for one semester. Um, again, just kind of trying to show the impact I had on Tia, trying to problem solve um, how to best help her kind of feel comfortable in her knowledge and understanding where her knowledge gaps were when her peers were performing at a higher rate than she was. 
I was also a COVID screener. That was really the only clinical experience I could get in college. I kind of procrastinated on that a little bit and waited until, of course, COVID hit to get like real clinical experience. And then this is also something that a lot of people have talked to me about. Um, I was in an organization called EARS, which is a peer mental health counseling program. And I was actually involved with it in three ways. So I was a peer mental health counselor. I was a trainer for people who want to become counselors. And then um, for my last year, I was actually the coordinate, coordinator for the first level of training. So I think that's really cool, showing like really deep involvement and involvement in multiple ways in an organization. Um, I had a lot of people kind of talk to me about this and comment on that stuff and how fun it was to be able to not only counsel people, but also teach people about mental health and things like that. And then I did also do a little bit of research in undergrad. Um, I worked in a neuroscience lab with rats. This is my shadowing. Um, I blurred it all out just for privacy reasons of the physicians, but I will say I shadowed um, two emergency medicine physicians, each for about six hours. Um, I shadowed an orthopedic surgeon for about 30 hours, and then I shadowed a psychiatrist for about, I think I said I had shadowed them for about 10 hours, and then I had projected that I was going to do another 28 um, before med school. Yeah, so here's again that ears. Um, this is when I was an actual trainer. And this is when I was a counselor. And then I was also in an organization where we helped put on concerts at our school. You know, med schools don't just want to see you involved in medicine. They want to see all of the other things that make you human and interest you. And music is a really big, important part of my life. Um, so this was really fun. And then I also put my employment. So I worked every summer to the max in order to pay for college. Um, and, you know, med schools want to know that. They want to know kind of what you're doing with your time, even if it's not medically related. So, you know, I was able to show, like, during my summers, I put in a good 2,500 hours just delivering food. And then you can also put hobbies. I decided to put the two most important hobbies to me, which are going to concerts. That is really my personality trait, hardcore. Everyone knows me as the girl that follows bands around the country. Um, and then I'm also a seamstress. And this actually got brought up a lot during my interviews. Everyone wanted to talk about me being a seamstress. And for a lot of my interviews, they had like an introduction portion where we all went around and like introduced ourselves to the other people interviewing. Um, and I would often say that like my fun fact was that I was a seamstress and everyone thought it was really cool, which was fun. It is a dying art. Okay. And then the last section is, of course, your personal statement. I've blocked this out here just because I want to do a full video on my personal statement. So stay tuned for that. Okay. You also have letters of recommendation. So I had three letters total. Um, I got a committee letter from Cornell. And then I also got an individual letter from my two bosses um, that I worked with at Vanderbilt. And as you can see, you can assign different letters to different people. So I sent my committee letter to everyone, but some schools wanted only one letter and they wouldn't accept more. So I couldn't send the other two to them. Um, so every school has a different requirement as far as letters go. You'll just have to look on their website to figure out you know, what you should send where. And then finally, these are all of the schools that I apply to. So if you've previously applied to medical school um, and this is like your second or third application cycle and you applied to that school before, um, you'll say yes here. But everything else, that is it. All righty, so that is an overview of my AMCAS application. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. And like I said, I'm gonna roll out a lot more videos um, discussing each part of the application in a lot more detail. So stay tuned for that. Until then, peace.